So conversion, when you have minutes and seconds and you're converting to degrees with decimals, then you need to divide. So 58 is going to be your whole number. 25 over 60 is going to be part of your decimals and 48 over 3,600 will be your decimals. And then you just really add those decimals up and that's your decimal place. So you should have gotten like 58.43 degrees here. When you're going the other direction, you divide. So you have to divide it twice. You have to take the point, or rather multiply, 0.71 and you multiply by 60. Um, and then you're gonna get a number, potentially you're gonna get a number, it depends on what your decimals look like, with a decimal place. So when you get that, you get 42.6. The 42 is your minutes. So 230, um, 230 degrees, 42 minutes, and then to find your seconds, take that 0.6 and multiply by 60 again. So 0.6 times 60 again will be your um, seconds. All right, so when you're going from minutes, seconds to degrees, divide from decimal degrees to minutes, seconds, multiply. And do it in steps. Multiply each piece of it or divide each piece of it. Uh, the conversion, if it's in degrees, multiply by pi over 180. I don't want decimals here, just reduce your fraction. If it is converting the other way from radians to degrees, just multiply by 180 over pi. All right? Easy enough. These word problems will either be sector area, um, arc length, or uniform motion problems. Okay, that's what these all consist of. You could have one that has both. I think one of these says, what's the arc length and the sector area, right? So it could combine two of the same. For your arc length, um, that is just a simple equation. That's just going to be theta in radians times r. Okay, for area of a sector, um, my area. So for area of a sector, it's going to be one half r squared times theta. Okay. That's what we're doing here. <clears throat> Pretty much it's the percentage of the circle you have um, times the either circumference of the circle or the area of the circle. I mean, that's this is really the same formula that you learned in like geometry, I think, but it's just written a different way. We're just moving into like radians versus degrees when you were in geometry. Um, for all of these, it, it wants it in radians. There are There is one where it gives it to you and then they say, tell me what it is in degrees. So they want you to back into the theta and then convert it to degrees. But when you're actually doing the measurement, it's going to be in radians, okay? It's going to be in radians here. And so for this, it traveled 35 minutes. You really just have to figure out for the theta, you're saying, what part of the circle do I have? Well, 35 out of 60 minutes is the part of the clock that you have. An entire circle in radians is 2 pi. So this is what your theta is going to equal on something like that. And then you just take him when you get that answer and multiply by 8. I mean, you should have gotten 29.32 here. All right, so find your theta however you need to. If they give you degrees, pi over 180. If they give you a portion of a circle, then it's the portion of the circle that you have times 2 pi. That is your theta. Theta just represents what part of the circle you have, okay? Um and then multiply by your radius. If it is an area problem, then you're gonna do this one half r squared times theta. Again, find your theta in radians. If they give it to you in degrees, pi over 180. If it gives it to you in a portion of the circle, then that portion times two pi. That is what you have in radians. And then r squared and then divided by two, all right? Then you can have something like this guy here, which is a uniform motion. When you see angular or linear speed, that is a uniform motion. And so for these, your omega, which is your angular speed, is just theta. That means um, how far you went, how many circles you went, but in radians, divided by how long it took you to do that, okay? How long it took you to do that. Your linear um, speed is just going to be the radius times your omega. So once you find your omega and you have some radius, just multiply by the radius and you can have your your linear okay so um the hundred feet is actually insignificant that's just there to have fun with you right it didn't ask you anything about the hundred um it's just telling you how big the carousel is then they say there's a penguin and a horse left to sit on you're deciding where you want to sit the penguin is 30 feet from the center the horse is 50 feet from the center 
If the ride lasts two minutes and goes around 10 times, what is the angular velocity in radians per minute? What is the linear velocity of each of those creatures in feet per minute? So if I'm finding my omega, I need to know what my theta is. Well, my theta is based on how many times I go around, right? How many times I go around is 10. Well, one circle is two pi. So 10 circles is gonna be 10 times two pi. So my omega here is 20 pi, 10 times two pi. 2 pi is one circle. I made 10 circles. Um, to find my omega, I have to take how many times I run around and divide it by how long it took me to go around. So I end up just getting 10 pi as my omega, which is, you know, I mean, pi is 3.14. So this is approximately 31.42 radians per minute. So that is my omega. That's my angular speed. To find the other two, you literally multiply by their radiuses. So my um, penguin, I think he's the first guy. My penguin is just going to be 30 times that guy that I found. And my horse is just going to be 50 times my omega. That's all we're doing here. Okay. This, this is, you should breeze through this section. This is Sokotoa. Okay. The, the only thing you need to pay attention to is, am I labeling it correctly? It's all in reference to the angle in which I'm talking about. Um, sometimes they will uh, be nice and they will give you everything you need. So for this guy, omega has your opposite and your hypotenuse. And they want cosecant, which is the reciprocal of sine, which is nice because that's hypotenuse over opposite. So for this one, um, you really just have to, again, this is over. So my sine is opposite over hypotenuse. This is going to buy hypotenuse over opposite. So they really gave you everything you need here. Reduce it right? But sometimes they won't. So in the next one, they actually didn't give you everything you need. This was kind of a see if you can recognize what type of triangle you have moment. Um, but for sine, if I'm looking at omega here, um, I really need opposite over hypotenuse for sine because that's what sine is. And I don't have my hypotenuse. Now, there's two ways to do this. You can use the Pythagorean theorem here, which will give you 16 squared to 2. Or if you recognize that this is a special right triangle that is 45, 45, 90, they're asking you for the sine of a 45 degree angle, which is square root of two over two. But if you didn't recognize that, use Pythagorean theorem, this is 16 square root of two. Um, or special right triangle, side, side, side square root of two. Um, it's gonna be 16 over 16 square root of two. You're gonna simplify that, reduce and rationalize square root of two over two because it's a 45 degree angle. But if they don't give you the side that you need, Pythagorean theorem, it is a right triangle. Never forget you have a squared plus b squared equals c squared. They are just looking for the angle. Remember when you're looking for your angle, you're gonna use the SOHCAHTOA, but in your calculator, you're gonna use your inverse functions, not your reciprocal, inverse functions, right? And so once again, I'm gonna look and see what I have. Omega is here, this guy is opposite, this guy is hypotenuse. So I would say the sine of omega would equal opposite over hypotenuse, which means the inverse sine of the opposite over the hypotenuse should equal my omega, which is what I'm looking for. And so for these, when you're looking for an angle, you're gonna use your inverse function on your calculator because the inverse is what undoes that function, which is what you're trying to do. And it does want to round to the nearest 10th here. So you would say 32.2 degrees. All right, a point on the circle, any point on the circle. They have given you your x and your y. R is gonna be the square root of x squared plus y squared. <clears throat> in this case, when you plug it in, the square root of square root of 19 squared plus nine squared is going to be square root of 100. So R here is gonna equal 10. They want the cosine. Remember for these, your sine is y over r, your cosine is x over r, and your tangent is y over x. And then your reciprocal functions are cosecant, si um, secant, and cotangent. They just flip those, right? Reciprocal functions. In this case, they want cosine. So they want my x value over my r value. They gave me my x value, negative square root of 19. I found my r value, 10. That is my answer. I am done. So if you look at this, they have given you the secant and they have told you the sine is negative, all right? So first of all, the secant is the reciprocal of your cosine. 
And they have told you that this is positive, right? You see that, I mean, by, it's just, it is positive. So my cosine is my X value. That is positive in the first and fourth quadrant. Then they told me my sine, which is my Y value, is negative. All right, so I am in the fourth quadrant here. So they want all four of these. What I typically do is I do, I write them all out. Sine, cosine, tangent, um, cosecant, secant, cotangent. I just write them all like that so I know that I need to remember to do all of them. And I go ahead and mark which ones I know are negative. They told me sine is negative, so I know this guy's gonna be negative and this guy's gonna be negative. My um, secant is positive, so I know my sine, my co cosine will also be positive, right? Um, and since my sine and cosine are different, my tangent and my cotangent will be negative. So I actually go ahead and do this just so I don't do anything stupid, right? And then the rest of it's just my ratios. Um, if they gave me secant, then they gave me my radius over my x value. That's what they gave me, right? And so you're gonna use the same process, Pythagorean theorem, x squared plus y squared equals r squared, um, to solve for your other side. Your other side would be three here. So my y value, my r is square root of 13, my x value is two. Um, so I'm gonna say 13 minus four is nine, square root of nine is three. But because I'm in the fourth quadrant, it is specifically positive or negative three. Fourth quadrant, my sign is going to be what? All right, so this is gonna be negative three because I am fourth quadrant. And now I have everything I need to just write out the things, right? My sign is going to be my Y value over my R, but then I need to rationalize it. So three squared to 13 over 13. Um, and then this is just gonna be the flip of that. By the way, I did negative three over square root of 13 and rationalized it. So this is gonna be square root of 13 over three. Cosecant, I already have um, secant, which is square root of 13 over two. When I flip that, I need to rationalize it, two square root of 13 over 13. And then my tangent's just gonna be y over x, so it's negative three halves, cotangent negative two thirds. Right, so it's just literally using Pythagorean theorem, finding your x, y, and r, and literally just listing them for me. Just list out the fractions. That's all you're doing for those six. All right, these are really testing your knowledge of your reference angles or your unit circle angles, those three, right? So it says give the reference angle and the exact value. Remember, reference angle is the closest to the x-axis. If I am in the fourth quadrant, my closest x-axis is my 360, okay? So if they gave me 300 to get the reference angle, it's just 360 minus 300. My reference angle here is 60 degrees. That's the first question answered. Based on what you know about those three that I told you you need to memorize, they want the tangent. The tangent is just your... Um, sine over your cosine, but hopefully I told, if I told you to remember sine, cosine, and tangent for these, but if you didn't, you can do sine over cosine. The tangent of a 60 degree angle is the square root of three, but I am in the fourth quadrant. The tangent in the fourth quadrant is negative. Okay. So you need to make sure that as you go through these, you know the sine here is positive, the cosine here is positive, the tangent is positive. The sine here is positive, the cosine here is negative, the tangent is negative. Sine here is negative, cosine here is negative, tangent is positive. Sine here is negative, cosine here is positive, tangent here is negative. You need to know those, all right, so that you get those, po those positives and negatives rack up, right, if you miss those on a test or quiz, all right. It is only partial credit, but it's a pretty strong partial credit when it's a negative and a number, and that's all you're answering for me. Okay. These are right angle word problems. So as long as you can draw an angle, you know, you're, you're good to go. Uh, honestly, it's not a, um, don't overthink these, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Not that y'all ever overthink, but don't overthink. Okay. <clears throat> so when this is asking for a man flies a kite with a 105 foot string, the angle of elevation to the strings 45, how high off the ground is the kite? 
you know, you, you've got um, the person down here, right? The kite string represents from this point to this point. If you've ever flown a kite, it's the angle. It's the one that's sloped, right? So this here is my kite string. Angle of elevation from the ground to the kite, well, that's from here up. That's 45 degrees. They want the height off the ground. So just like you did in like two sections ago, label it. You're going to say, well, this is opposite. This is hypotenuse. I'm going to use Sokotoa. Opposite over hypotenuse is sine. The sine of 45 equals h over 105. Multiply by 105, 74.2 feet here. So for this one, it's it's literally two, two triangles here. Okay, so we have one there, and then we have one like here. Oh, I need to make him clear, so we'll do him opaque. Here we go. Let's see. All right, to the bottom of the building. Actually, it's going to be like that. All right, so why did I draw it like that? Well, I have a building here. This is my tall building. All right, my tall building is, I'm going to assume it's going to be right here. Okay, oh, no, I don't want a triangle anymore. Um, my tall building is right here. And then I have this shorter building right here. And obviously, you can see I drew my angle a little wrong. All right, so if I have two buildings, I've created two triangles. From the top down to the top of the building is this little green triangle. And then from the top to the bottom is this little red triangle. That's what they've given me. They've given me two different angles. So if I were to look at these, that is from the top of the tall building to the top of the short building. And this is from the top of the tall building to the bottom of the short building, okay? Both of the bases of these are 60. How do I know that? Well, they're 60 feet apart. And unless it's moving back and forth and I don't really want to be in that building, then the top and the bottom should both be 60 feet apart if they built it correctly. So... I know that they're 60 feet apart, so I automatically know that this base here is 60 feet for both of them, right? Um, and I know the angle of depression. Now, here's the thing. The angle of the depression is technically this angle up here, but the angle of depression from the top is also the angle of elevation from the bottom, right? Because it says the angle of depression from the top, that's going to be this guy up here, but it's going to be the same as if I were on the short building looking up. So I have... This angle here is 27 degrees, and this angle here is 52 degrees. And so I really just need the total height and the height difference, right? The total height is going to be the tall building. If I subtract the difference between them, that will be the short building. So I'm literally just doing tangent twice, right? And solving for the height of the tall building and subtract the difference to get the height of the short building. All right, so just think about it as two triangles. Find one height, that's the height of this guy, using tangent. Tangent of 52 is height over 60. Find the height of this guy, <clears throat> that's the difference between the two. Tangent of 27 is height over 60. All right, so I've already found the tall building. Subtract the difference and you'll get the short building. Okay.